Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection, of course, as usual. Um, today's theorem is actually kind of fun, or it's more like lemma type. Uh, it's usually called the lemma, uh, but I really don't know the difference between lemma and theorem anyway. So let's just let's be just call it theorem, and it's about determinants. So it's a very funny way to generalize determinants in a ridiculous to, to a ridiculous generality, which shocked me a little bit when I saw it for the first time. So it's a very combinatorial way. And in a lot of cases, this lemma theorem, whatever you want to call it, helps you to reduce, well, sophisticated determinant calculations to just counting certain things in graphs. And that's what people like to do kind of everywhere in mathematics. A counting problem is always a good problem. But of course, in particular in combinatorics, this is just what, what people usually do, right? For a living, combinatorics is the art of counting. So this lemma actually arose from a question in combinatorics. Um, but as I said, you can just see it uh, in a vacuum completely, um, regardless whether you like combinatorics or not, just as a lemma about determinants, kind of a very funny generalization. So let's have a look. Um, so we start with a classic, really a classic. Um, the determinant formula for matrix. So let's recall how it works. And of course I recall it, maybe not of course, but I definitely like to recall it in a three by three example, because I think um, if you understand the three by three example, you understand the general picture anyway. Um, the computations will blow up, obviously, if you want to do a 20 by 20 matrix, but you can feed it into the machine in case anyway. So let's just have a look at the three by three example. So I have my matrix M and it just has the usual entries well, or the usual appearance, m1, 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 and 2 and so on. And the determinant formula in general, I've just written it here for you to remember, and I will explain it in a second, kind of ignoring a little bit the sign. I will just comment on the sign very briefly, but the sign is always a little bit tricky um, and delicate, so I always get it wrong. It's not so bad, obviously, but it's kind of very confusing, and I always get it wrong. So I'm completely ignoring the sign throughout this video. And then, yeah, well, this is how it works, or this is how, at least how I would like to think about it. So what I need to do is I need to write down all permutations of three in this case. So for example, let me take this one here. So there's six of them. I just listed them here. So one, two, three, four, five, and the one I will take here, six. So let me just have a look at this one. It looks like this. And the way I want to read it is I have three numbers at the bottom, so the permutation of three numbers. And now I just follow the strings and put them on the top. So this sends one to position three. So I write down M, one goes to position three. Uh, and this sends two to one. M, two goes to position one. And it sends three to two. M, three goes to position two. So this element here. And you just do the same for all permutation and take the sum. Okay, it will be an alternating sum that we comment on the sign uh, just right now here. Um, so you just count the number of crossings in those diagrams, so I have one crossing here, one crossing here, that means the sign is positive. So an even number means sign is positive. I have one crossing here, sign is negative. I have one crossing here, sign is negative. Zero crossing, sign is positive. Two crossings, sign is positive. I, I did just this one, two crossings, sign is positive. And three crossings, so sign is negative. So that's how you do it. Just write down those string diagrams for um, corresponding uh, sets here, in, in this case, permutations of one, two, and three, and just follow the strings, and that's what you write down, and just take the alternating sum. And that's the determinant of the matrix, and actually a pretty nice formula uh, for this determinant. And yeah, it took quite a while, really quite a while, before it was generalized. So um, the idea for this um, video is based on a very nice um, part of the book, uh, proofs from the book, which is linked in the description. And this lemma or theorem, whatever you want to call it, actually has a very slick proof. So it was one of these brilliant ideas where people realized, just reformulated the problem a little bit, were easy to generalize. And then the proof was kind of, it, it was kind of easy. It's not so hard. I, I won't show you the proof. It's too hard in my opinion for a YouTube video, uh, but it's actually not so bad. So maybe I, I'm just lazy. Anyway, so this is how it works. So what, what we want to do is, and what this lemma does, absolutely brilliant, it translates the determinant in a problem in graph theory. And then it's a certain type of graph for which the determinant shows up. And then the lemma says this works in general for any type of graph. That's basically what it is. So let's have a look at um, the determinant as a description of uh, a graph. So what they explain is the following. I stay with my three by three example. 
So we write down the rows and the columns, just one vertex for each row and one vertex for each column. And you do it in this bipartite fashion with something on the top and something on the bottom. And then you connect them, um, just, just complete, completely connect them from rows to columns. And each one of the edges is then labeled by the corresponding entries. So here, here, so this would be one, three. So I would like to see, think of these as one, two, three. So row one, row two, row three, column one, column two, column three. And one and one are connected by M11, obviously. And for example, one and three are connected by M13 and so on. And you just write down this graph. It's a usual graph. There's an orientation involved. The orientation gives you the sign. I'm not going into details, but anyway, it's basically a graph with a certain type of labels. Um, so what they explain is kind of this funny idea that the matrix in some sense is the same as this graph. So it's this rated directed bipartite graph. As I said, directed is not so important in this video. This is weighted. Weighted is just the name for those guys here. So you put uh, for each edge, you just put the number that you see in the matrix. You call it weighted. And bipartite is this uh, what partition into rows and columns of the graph. And what they explain is then the determinant of the matrix is just the weighted sign sum over whatever whatever it's called vertex disjoint path system, which I will denote by VDPS. We'll see that in a second in an example. But kind of the point here, which you might have already seen here right now, is that there's a certain graph, and from a certain graph, using a certain description or a certain procedure, you can read off the determinant. And then the idea of the lemma and kind of the statement of the lemma, a theorem, whatever you want to call it, will be, well, take your favorite graph and the same works, and you get a very, very huge generalization of the determinant, which is ridiculous in some sense, because the determinant formula is ancient, whatever, 300 years old or so, um, not in the modern formulation, of course, but it, it certainly was well known for a long time. And this one here is pretty new. Uh, link it to the original paper is in the description, actually. So this is a shockingly beautiful and uh, easy idea in some sense. So let's have a look at basically how that works. Kind of the same setup again. And what you take is you take those VDPS, vertex disjoint pass systems. So vertex disjoint path system is just a collection of paths, which is vertex disjoint. So here um, I have three of them and you just need to uh, include all vertices. So here I take three paths. This is my M12 entry, this is my 21 entry, and this is my 33 entry. Remember this is two, this is one, so this is two one, this is one, this is two, this is one two in this reading convention and here nothing, nothing, nothing really interesting happens. So this is three one. And in this red picture, you can see the permutations from before, of course. There's just uh, more random no noise in the background if you want. And then they explain, yeah, well, this is a path system and they denote it by, was well, this vertex disjoint path system and they denote it by P sigma. And it's really just a collection of, in this case, just edges because it's so simple. In general, it will be really pass. So it's just uh, one edge per vertex at the top, basically. And then they say, okay, a weight is just whatever you see at the edge that you multiply. So the weight of my path system here would be just the multiplication of what I see, M11, M21, M33, right? I'll give you another example uh, in a second. And then the reinterpretation of the determinant is just, okay, there's some sign involved, which I'm going to ignore, but the reinterpretation of the uh, determinant would be then the determinant of my matrix M, this was supposed to be an M, is, uh, the weighted sum or the, the sum over all vertex disjoint path systems of those weighted paths. Okay, doesn't sound, okay, it's a reformulation in terms of graphs. It's not that shocking a priori, right? But it's just a, a graph, a bipartite graph, certain type of graph, and it's just a reformulation. And the theorem or lemma, whatever you want to call it, is then a beautiful generalization. So let's have a look. So it basically works for any graph. So there's a certain condition. Okay, we want it to be finite, check. We want it to be weighted, check. We already had that. We want it to be directed, there's a sign involved. And the acyclic condition is really necessary for the proof, which I'm not going to show you, but it's, it's kind of a little bit of a harmless condition. So here's an example of an acyclic graph, although you kind of see here, so let's say here in this, in this little slice here, it looks like there is a cycle. So acyclic means there is no cycle, but this is not an oriented cycle. So as you can see, um, I, I can't go back from this vertex, right? So acyclic, di acyclic directed means 
uh, asymptotic, so no cycles as a directed graph, which is a way stronger condition than just being just acyclic as an undirected graph. So anyway, so most graphs kind of will do. And what you now do is you pick a set A, you pick a set B, huh? so I have my A and B here. In my picture below, I've picked this one here and I've picked this one here, so this is A and this is B. I don't like this vertex, for example. So you pick those two sets. These are now your rows and columns of a new matrix and you take the pass matrix and the determinant of this pass matrix is given by exactly the same formula. The, the, the sum, the sign sum over all of those funny past systems. And this generalizes the uh, uh, determinant formula to this huge, to this huge graph, uh, class of graphs. It's, it's just ridiculously general now. Um, so let's have a look at this example. So for example, instead of taking this easy graph here uh, from, from the original determinant, you could take any graph you want, basically as long as it's kind of acyclic. So I take this graph and I, I divide, as I said, my set of edges into A and B, and I kind of don't need the rest anymore. So this edge is gone, and this edge is gone, and I only need the edges um, not between A and B. So this edge is kind of boring here, and this edge is also boring. Uh, but I only need the edges between A and B. I don't need the edges, say it again, uh, because I messed it up. I only need the edges between A and B, not the edges in A or in B. Okay, so I, I get rid of this one here, and I get rid of this one. So what remains is what I name here A, B, C. And the pass matrix uh, now looks as follows. It's just this matrix A, 0, B, C. Let's see whether this is correct. So the first vertex is connected to both of them by A and B, so A, B. And uh, last, the, the second vertex is only connected to the, um, to the second one, so 0, C. And you can check easily that the determinant would be A times C. And that's exactly the same as the uh, uh, vertex disjoint pass sum of those um, of this graph, which is well, of course just what is the vertex disjoint pass sum here? Well, if I choose A, I can take B, or uh, if I choose A, um, I can take A or B, but I can't take really B because I don't have any choice here. So I need to take this edge, and then I need to take this edge. So it's A times C, which is kind of uh, expected, and it's exactly the formula you get. So a huge generalization of the determinant formula. And it took, whatever, 200 years to be found. Very amazing. And of course, um, this is then extremely practical. Um, so what people like to do with this lemma theorem, whatever you want to call it, is whenever you have a determinant problem, for example, and you don't really want to compute the determinant because computing determinants is a bit tricky. Uh, so you just turn it into a problem in graph theory and you count those paths. Um, instead of red, to just count paths in a graph. Um, so here's a funny application, for example, there's a, a certain type of uh, formula for the determinant is called cauchy binet um, and it works like this. I just wrote it out. It's not so important, but basically the determinant of P times Q can be uh, computed by a determinant of P times the determinant of Q if you just distinguish it in Z and the kind of Z is kind of this, um, row set and column sets that you take either for, for P or for Q. So for one of them, it's a row set, for the other one, it's a column set. Doesn't matter so much what it is, but this classical formula, extremely classical, can be proven from graphs and this kind of fight. So what you do is you write down this, this bigger graph now. So here is kind of my first matrix, the P matrix. So it starts here and it ends here, and here's my Q matrix, um, the Q matrix. And the PQ matrix, uh, this is a, a wrong Q, of course, um, the, the Q matrix. Um, the, the PQ matrix is, of course, just then going from here to here. That's a PQ matrix. Uh, and you want to know the determinant of the PQ matrix, and you can uh, divide it into the determinant of the top and the determinant of the bottom, which you can then easily prove by this counting, because you just need to count those paths, which you can do locally in the top and in the bottom. So you just can prove this, well, not quite trivial classical lemma from um, linear algebra using graphs and counting counting paths in graphs, which I've kind of, kind of found very impressive. And now you can probably imagine that if you have a more sophisticated determinant problem, you will have a more sophisticated graph, but you usually be, are be able to, or you very often are able to solve it by just looking at the corresponding path systems, which I find very, very surprising. Okay, so let me wrap up. So. Um, 
we had the classical determinant formula and the brilliance of the lemma or theorem, whatever you want to call it, I showed you was kind of reformulated in terms of graphs. And as soon as you have some reformulation in terms of graphs, it's kind of easy or somehow um, predicted that you can guess some kind of a generalization, which works for a more general class of graphs. So the generalization here basically works for all graphs. You need this acyclic condition because otherwise the proof goes wrong. Um, but otherwise, kind of any graph you want. So you take any graph, you divide it into a row set and a column set, and the various determinants you could cook up from there. You can just compute them by counting paths, which I find is very, very surprising. So I like this lemma a lot. Um, it's a count in, in the end, calculating determinants is a counting problem, which is a little bit of a shocking um, statement in some sense. So at least it shocked me a lot. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I also hope to see you next time.